Hi everyone and welcome. So to this is today's Lunch and Learn. I'm very happy to be joined here today by Gary Ward from Yoten. Hello Gary. How are you? Everyone? How are you today? Hot. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, I'm in I'm in England, and even here it's 30 degrees. So how you're in you're in Palmer? It's about the same. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm in Palmer. It's about the same. Yeah, we're not equipped for it over here. <laughs> and um, also here in the middle we have Joanna. Hi, Joanna. Joanna Hi, everyone. Hi, Abby. Hi. Um, and Joanna will be in the background mastering this webinar to ensure that everything runs smoothly. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to, to start and introduce today's topic, please, Joanna. Yes. Great. So as I've said, welcome everybody. Good, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, and thank you for joining us today with our Lunch and Learn with Yoten. So today's topic is anti-fouling technology, past, present and future. And this is a topic that I know is of huge value to uh, super yacht captains and heads of departments and owners and management alike. Yoten have been a partner of A Crew for several years now. And uh, Gary, who's well known to us, um, has run conversations around the subject of anti fouling at several of our um, in presence events in Mallorca and Tarragona and other places. Uh, because obviously this is of ongoing interest to the industry. Um, so thanks to the power of the World Wide Web and, um, and our webinars that we're running now, we're really pleased to be able to bring this to everyone virtually. Um, so in today's session, Gary is going to be discussing anti-fouling technologies, where they originated, looking back into the past, where they are today, but also what you can expect in the future and he'll then be moving on to an understanding of the paint composition. And finally, we'll, we're going to be looking at how to select the best anti-fouling for yachts unique criteria. We're obviously understanding that every yacht has a different specification, different needs, and it's not one size fits all. Um, but first of all, before I hand over to Gary, um, I'd like to introduce Gary, if I may. That's a good photo of me, that is. <laughs> <laughs> that was on a better day. We've got you in stereo, double quote, but having you on video wasn't enough, Gary, so we needed your photo too. Um, so Gary joined Yoten in 2015 and was quickly recognised as a prominent player in, in the field of, the, of, of coatings, in the coatings market. But we at Acrew, we got to know Gary back in 2017 uh, as he made his move over to Palmer where he joined the Yoten office in Palmer and heads up the Yoten Care. Uh, so Yoten Care, I'm sure Gary will be telling you more about that Absolutely, himself, yeah. but I think it's very much in, within the ethos of how we understand Yoten, which is a company that not only takes pride in its product, but also its relationship with the client and the life cycle. And obviously um, your paint job um, or your anti-fouling, you know, it needs to be perfect. Um, upon uh, you know during the refit and immediately after but also for as long as possible in its life afterwards um, we know Gary pretty well I would say so I think not too well not too well, <laughs> not too well. I did actually see you on the decks I think uh, <laughs> yes yes that was a couple of weekends ago yeah <laughs> so, well that's that's what I wanted to say actually Gary because I think the super yacht industry, as we all know, is an industry that demands absolute excellence in professional service and, and the products that we all use, but it is also an industry of personal relationships. So what I would like to say about you that is probably something that you wouldn't you know, easily say yourself um, is that I think you were very easily um, adapted to the soup your industry because I think it comes very natural to you to be a very serious professional and somebody that I know clients can rely on and trust and that you'll always deliver but also a good guy to have around you're you're a fun guy very, very to nice to very nice to hear Abby <laughs> I'll buy you that drink next time okay <laughs> <laughs> you've got my hidden agenda <laughs> But anyway, if we could move on to the to the topic of today's lunch and learn session itself. 
So this week we're going to be discussing anti-fouling technology and as I've already mentioned Gary's going to be looking at where that originated right through to what we can expect in the upcoming years. Um, I think key to this topic is a couple of elements. This is, you know, number one, anti-fouling concerns every single vessel out there. You know, this is a component that infects the entire marine industry, regardless of the size or the draft or you know of your yacht or whether it's a motor yacht or sailing yacht. This this affects absolutely everyone. And I think it's also a, a topic that's very live and will continue to be of importance because every year, quite rightly, I may add, um, environmental awareness and concern and work towards minimizing our environmental impact becomes more and more important. And with that in mind, we need to be well educated about all of the products we're using. And I would say perhaps none are as prevalent as anti-fouling in that and um, it's really interesting knowing a little bit about this topic from having listened to you previously Gary understanding about the impact um, potentially the positive impact on reducing the carbon footprint that anti-fouling can have and potentially how it could even enhance the performance of the, the vessel itself um, but I'm not the anti-fouling expert, so Are I will sure? stop there. <laughs> I needn't come. I could have stayed in bed. <laughs> but anyway, thank you, Gary. At this point, um, Joanna and I will will disappear, stay <laughs> there, and we'll let you take the stage. Um, if I may just add, actually, before Gary starts, please do um, add in any questions. Let us know. Let us know where you're uh, listening, watching from how you are um, and any questions you have ask them through the chat at any point during the webinar Joanna and I will be reading and checking the chat and we can either address them at the time or at the end we will follow up on any of those questions so without further ado Gary the stage is yours fantastic thank you very much uh, for the very positive introduction I've got a lot to live up to now thanks you thank you thank you Abby <laughs> um, Yes, so w welcome everybody, um, and uh, I hope you're all having a, a, a good, um, a thoroughly good Wednesday. I know it's been a bit of a tricky situation over the past few months for everybody involved, so um, I hope you're all staying safe, and um, and I hope for those guys that are on board that you're going to have a, you know, at least a, a good end of the Mediterranean season. Um, I'll keep my fingers crossed for you guys. What we'll be discussing today is, as Abby's quite rightly said, is anti-fouling technologies. Um, it won't necessarily be in the same format uh, or same rhythm as what Abby said, but we're going to be covering off all of those um, areas. Uh, and the, the kind of idea is to really empower you guys out there and everybody involved um, to make the right decisions, to make the right decisions that's, that's fit for purpose uh, for your individual requirements. So I'm going to share my screen because uh, I, I believe this is probably going to be the best way of sharing the presentation. Um, and I'll just open it up here. Infinity and beyond. OK, so we'll just start from here. Hopefully everybody can see this. If uh, if we've got any problems, um, please, you know, raise your hand or just let us know and we'll uh, we'll rectify that. But hopefully you can everybody, everybody can see my screen. So um, as Abby has explained, my my role within Yoten um, in its title form is Super Yacht Fleet Support Manager. I get told quite often it's a very fancy title, um, but it's probably the most apt title because it does explain exactly what my role is within the business. It is to support the fleet of Jotun clientele, effectively the Jotun painted vessels within the super yacht industry um, upon their operational life cycle. So if you can imagine you'll be in a refit or dry dock um, scenario or even possibly a new build yard, you'll be um, supported by the local countries of Jotun, the local technical team and the local uh, commercial team. But once you become operational, um, and as you've probably experienced uh, in previous uh, scenarios, you don't generally have a contact from the paint manufacturer until your next dry dock or refit. Um, that's where I feel that gap. That's where I feel that need, hopefully. Uh, and I am that person you can contact for any training requirements um, and just basically uh, uh, information on, on, on paint in general 
I'm here to support the, the fleet out there. And how we deliver this is, as uh, Abby's mentioned, is through the Jotun Care Initiative. Uh, Jotun Care as an initiative has been run by Jotun for the past uh, two, nearly almost three years now in the background, but it will be going through an official market launch this year. Um, what is entailed in that Jotun Care? Well, everything from, uh, like I say, a personal contact from myself, but if you need training on uh, understanding anti fouling technologies, but also care and maintenance on top coats, if you're looking for specifications to take with you for your next dry dock or refit that fit the criteria for the yacht. Um, we also uh, give um, uh, periodic inspections on the top coat just to see how the top coat is performing on Jotun uh, painted yachts. So uh, we can all keep track of how the performance is working. So it's quite a lot of facets to Jotun care, but it's really built around the fact that we are very much um, uh, interested and engaged with our clientele. We want to make sure that you guys are well catered for upon leaving a reef or dry dock. As you can see on the left hand side there, there is a, um, an application on the iPad. Uh, you can download that free of charge. It's specifically designed for crew members in the uh, super yacht arena, but it's quite useful for most people, whether you're a, 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 yacht, a yacht manager, uh, working in a management company or something along those lines. This really does uh, help you in that respect as well. So I really encourage anybody that's got uh, access to an iPad. It is only available at the moment on iPad, but shortly, uh, quite soon, hopefully it will be uh, available on all iOS devices and Android. Um, at this point, I'm going to ask uh, if we can um, set the first uh, poll. We're gonna test the poll. We've got, just got a couple of questions as we go throughout. So I don't know if, um, uh, Joanna, you can uh, help me on that one. Sure. The poll, the poll is on. Okay, the poll is on. Yeah, perfect. Yes. So this poll is is a bit of fun, um, but there is some seriousness to it in in the fact that uh, it's regarding penguins. Um, <laughs> that's the serious bit. <laughs> yeah, that's the serious bit. Uh, <laughs> for, for the people that don't know, and you can see on the logo in front of you at the moment, we have a penguin that is covering a globe. Um, which is the Jotun, uh, the Jotun logo. And there is a story behind the penguin, which I won't bore you with, or I wouldn't say bore, that's the wrong word to use, but I won't go into details with you uh, with it now. But it's very interesting. And I've got a lot of facts around penguins. So have we, have we had results in from the poll? Well, we're getting results in, and I'm afraid it's a complete tie. So... Um... Okay, what have we got? <laughs> <laughs> so for the biggest penguin in the world, nobody okay. thought that it would be three meters but then we've got an absolute even split of 33 percent between okay. two meters 1.2 and 0 0.5 so uh, what's the answer gary well the tallest the, the, the biggest penguin in the world today is oh it has changed okay. <laughs> sorry okay <laughs> two but meters it... just just went up somebody's okay. added a vote yeah they've been doing google searches that's why <laughs> <laughs> i'm just saying um but no the uh uh the the biggest penguin in the world as we stand at the moment is the is the king emperor penguin which is it averages around 1.2 meters and about 45 kilograms there's a, some fascinating uh um uh details of that particular penguin but yes the tallest or the biggest penguin that ever lived on this planet was two meters tall and quite significant in weight as well so um quite quite yeah. a beast quite a beast yeah so a bit of fun you, but uh, you're gone did, you, did your love for penguins originate with yotan or or did you bring with you a love for penguins uh it, it's 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 been developed from, <laughs> from, from Jotun. <laughs> yes no it's been quite but it is actually they're, they're quite an impressive uh impressive creature to be honest um and yeah. they have uh, yeah, I, I won't bore people with it now, but uh, yeah, it'd be if ever you're in a dock bar in STP or if you're somewhere and you spot me, ask me about penguins and I can uh, over a beer, preferably. <laughs> it, it's the nicest brand story I know, so yeah, probably. Yeah, good it, is, a it is a very nice, yeah, it's a very nice brand story, that's right. So, um, okay, so we'll, we'll move on. That's the introductory done, um, and we'll move on to super yacht anti foulings and try and get this covered off. So during the presentation, I'll be covering off four areas. Um, the first area is the Jotun overview. So for those people that are not aware uh, who Jotun are, um, this industry within the super industry, we're 
probably a little less known than in other industries, especially in the other marine industries. Um, so it'd be good for anybody that has some knowledge or maybe limited knowledge of who Yotan are, just to give you an overview of who we are. Hopefully that will also reinforce the fact that what I'm sharing with you today um, is, is coming from a point of quality, um, not just of uh, uh, Google searches. <laughs> and we'll be covering the, ba the basics of paint. And what I mean by that, it will be the composition of paint. The reason I'm doing that is because I think it is unfair to talk about the structure of an anti-fouling paint or what an anti-fouling paint differentiates itself away from the basics of paint without giving you that uh, the basics of, of how paint is comp composed. So we'll cover it off pretty briefly. Then we'll touch on the anti-fouling technology as it is today, um, what's involved in both in the past, but also what's in today. And then it will follow on to a, just a, a kind of a summary and then uh, a an overview of some of the perspective uh, uh, future of, uh, or, or technologies that uh, may exist in the future and already are being uh, explored in anti-fouling. So before we go on to this one, I just want to put another poll out. We've tested the poll um, and I don't know if uh, you can send out the poll for uh, the understanding of who Yotan are. Has anybody had experiences with Yotan? If that's okay, yes. Joanna? Yes. Oh, it's on. Okay, perfect. Um, it's just really to get me, to give me an insight as to where people are in terms of understanding who Yotan are. Um, I mean, we'll cover it off in this slide. And hopefully by the end of this slide, you'll understand that we, you know, we've, we've been around for a, a, a very long time. I'm very well established globally. You'll be pretty pleased then, because at the moment we have a 100% yes. I won't, I won't even bother with this slide then. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably because all of these people on the call are my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we'll, we'll cover off that anyway, anyway, just so to give people any, any indication or any information they're not aware of. Well, actually, the sorry, the poll is obviously a moving feast, and yep. it now has sixty-six percent yes, but thirty-three percent have heard of Yotan but never used Yotan. Okay, perfect. That's fine. Let's just like I say, just to give it an indication of where we are. Yep. So, um, Jotun was uh, was effectively born from a marine background and established in 1926 by the uh, gentleman on the left-hand side, which is Oddly Senior. Um, he recognized very early on, having worked in a, in a marine environment. So he worked in the whaling industry, which is a big industry in, uh, and previously was a huge industry in the Scandinavian region, and in particular in Norway. Um, he very quickly recognized that there was probably better ways in which uh, the fleet of whaling vessels could be protected and the uh, improvements that could be made. And through this, this development, through this, uh, excellently executed plan um, and all whilst ma maintaining it's a, a family business we find ourselves where we where we are today so we're you know we're coming on for almost 100 years in existence and we are now uh, 39 factories worldwide um, the most uh, kind of I would say let's say important uh, factory for our industry uh, uh, is uh, the factory we have in Barcelona which produces uh, the majority of products for the CPO industry from from Yotan. Um, but that that number is always growing. Uh, we're always developing and always looking at new um, new markets and, and, and new uh, regions to develop as well. Uh, we are represented. Um, so where we don't have a factory, we may have an, a, a, a sales office, I would call it, but also a warehouse where we can actually distribute products. Um, and we're represented in that fashion in over 100 countries worldwide. We have a big dealer network as well supporting that. So quite significant. We, uh, we now employ over 10,000 plus employees and we actually, uh, we call these employees internally penguins. Um, but again, I'm not going to go on the penguin, the penguin route. Um, so we can, I can explain that another time. But, um, but yes, over 10,000 plus employees and the vast majority of these employees are extremely technically have an extremely good technical knowledge it's one belief that Jotun have is that everybody should have a good level of technical understanding of, of the industry they're in um 
to give you the, the kind of a scope of size uh, of Yoten, so in 2019, we, we supplied well in excess of 920 million litres of product uh, globally. And, you know, had it not been for the current pandemic, we may have far exceeded that this year as well. We work in four key focus segments. OK, so one is marine. Marine is obviously uh, it, it does encompass yachting and super yachting. But it is a, a, a very large industry in its broadest sense. And to give you an indication of the, the size of Yotun within that uh, whole marine industry, it's, it's estimated on average one to maybe one and a half vessels uh, in every five are protected with Yotun worldwide. So a big, big number. Um, but like I say, uh, we have many different uh, areas within marine. Everything from cruise liners, super yachting, yachting, you know, in terms of its recreational sense. And then we have, you know, freight container vessels. The list goes on. It's a very big market. Um, we also focus in protective. Protective, um, and again, encompasses many different areas. So this can be everything from uh, the most iconic buildings in the world. So to give you, again, an example, uh, the Burj Khalifa in, uh, in Dubai, the tallest building in the world at the moment is a project that, uh, that Yotun supplied throughout, that both is basically using all of these four segments, a single source, source solution. But it can be everything from, um, like I say, uh, uh, iconic buildings, bridges, yeah, so infrastructure, um, but it can also be oil and gas, petrochemical, the list, the list goes on. Uh, then we have decorative. Decorative isn't so big in the, uh, maybe or as, uh, so, for instance, if you live in Spain or in the UK or some of the other countries, in the actual fact, you may not recognize Yotun as being a decorative product. Um, but if you go into the Middle East and the Far East, you will see Yotun everywhere. It is a very big brand in those regions. Um, but it is increasing day by day in, uh, in Europe as well. Um, and then we have powder coatings. Powder coatings is obviously um, an area that many people forget, um, but is a huge industry. The laptop I'm using right now um, is powder coated. The uh, I'm looking down at a, a, um, a, a what do you call it? A heater uh, which is powder coated. The window frames are powder coated. So powder coating is absolutely everywhere. Components on cars are powder coated. It's it's an extremely big industry as well, and we're very well known in that industry as well. Okay, so that gives you a bit of an overview of Jotun. This is our um, Let's call it our, our latest development. This is our headquarters in Sandefjord in Norway. It's an absolutely stunning location. Um, that's where Jotun has been since day one, 1926. Um, but this building is the closest everyone will get in this industry of working in an environment like, uh, I would say, like a, a Google or a Facebook. The environment in this building, it's now finished and completed, is incredible. And it's an incredible location. So anybody that has an opportunity, um, in the future to go to Sandefjord. Uh, we take a lot of clients there to, to show them around. I would really encourage to do so because it is a fantastic, fantastic place. Uh, I'm very, very proud to be working for a company that's there. So on to paint, the foundations of paint. Um, as I said, it's, it's good to remember that paint uh, or coatings, as some people would refer it to, is absolutely everywhere. If you look around the room you're in at the moment, you'll probably recognize that there's uh, decorative coatings on the wall. Uh, there's coatings on the desks you may be using, um, on the electronic devices you're using. And if you look out of the window, I have a window next to me, I can see many cars out there um, that are uh, protected and aesthetically painted as well. So paint is, is literally everywhere and it's, it, it actually forms a very important in, 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 uh, in, uh, part within our world. Um, so very briefly, I want to show you a video. I think um, I think Joanna's going to play that from the uh, webinar platform. So uh, if you can do that, Joanna. Yes. Perfect. If we can just mute ourselves for the video. <laughs> yeah. Two seconds. The Earth is a dynamic planet, always changing under the extreme forces of nature. Erosion, corrosion, and fouling 
are nature's own way of claiming back the building blocks forming the visible planets. Man-made constructions, important to our modern societies, are equally exposed to these forces and need to be protected. Jotun is a global company dedicated to this task. We keep the world moving forward by providing industries with sophisticated solutions protecting our future values. Just imagine what our world would look like without Jotun. 90% of all world trade is done by ship. If these vessels were not protected by coatings, your access to basic necessities would be extremely limited. Without proper corrosion protection, your supply of clean water would be severely compromised. Oil and gas facilities would be impossible to operate, limiting supplies like fuel, petroleum and electricity. At Jotun, we protect property by providing solutions that not only enhance the appearance of assets, but also ensures long-lasting durability. Our products have a huge impact for everyone, every day. No matter where you are in the world, Jotun won't be far away. As the world is changing, new challenges arise. Jotun is prepared for tomorrow by never losing sight of our goal. Jotun protects property. Excellent. Okay, everybody can hear me? Loud and clear. Perfect. So I will share the presentation again. Excellent. So as you can see, as I mentioned, um, you know, coatings are absolutely everywhere and are intrinsic to, to what we uh, know as our modern world. Um, and it will continue to be that way um, for the foreseeable. Um, moving on slightly. Um, so let's talk about paint in its general sense. Um, I'll just click there we go. So paint, it's nothing complicated. Uh, <laughs> I chuckle. <laughs> uh, you get presented as potential users uh, of, uh, of products, technical data sheet, application guides, um, you know specifications maybe and they can have all of these different terminologies uh, you may even have reports done by uh, surveyors and you will have all of these different excellent words and they all mean something epoxy polyester and you've got a hydrophobic hydrophilic you've got you know you've got to think about uh, distinction of image you've got microns dfts many many things to think about and then you get presented with anti fouling paint technology <clears throat> and then you get presented with self-polishing coatings Copper acrylate, by side of FRCs, literally it feels like you're in a world of wizardry. Um, but let me assure you, all of these words really don't need to mean much to you. Um, and also to me, really, these are terms that are used. Um, a lot of these are chemical compositions and you know chemical terms that are used for uh, chemists and, and the more technical end of coatings. 
But for everyday use, uh, uh, you know, we don't need to really understand that. What we do need to understand is um, what they actually mean to you. So I'm going to break it down very simply. <clears throat> and before we do that, we're going to talk about what is paint. So paint has been around for 50,000 years, at least, as far as we know. And um, it's, it was very rudimentary, very basic um, composition back 50,000 years ago. An image on the right hand side you can see now is an image taken from a cave in Spain. And uh, it's believed to be about 40,000 years old. This is a very, again, rudimentary, rudimentary uh, and a very basic composition of, of what we'd class as paints. So this is made from charcoal and, and ochre. Um, but as obviously uh, time has passed on, it's, it's developed and it's uh, taken on a different form. Uh, but in essence, paint is a colored substance which is spread over a surface and dries to leave a thin decorative or protective film. In some instances, and so a thin decorative and protective film. So um, to give you an idea of where we've come from, um, this is a very famous paint shop called uh, Senilia in, uh, in Paris, and it still exists as a brand today. This was a paint shop that was used by artists like Picasso. And what you see in front of you is very, very similar to what you, how you would have um, bought paint 100 plus years ago. You would have gone into a shop like this and the person um, standing behind the desk there would have uh, effectively been a chemist in, in its kind of basic sense. They would have formulated a product to meet your criteria, your need, your color, you know, texture, whatever. They would have come up with that uh, in the shop and then supplied you that over the counter. But of course, uh, we had the emergence of the Industrial Revolution where we had a lot of steel trucks, steel structures being built. Um, and there was a, a huge need, a huge requirement, an increased requirement for paint. So then we saw the industrialization of paint. And you can see on the right hand side, it's one of our factories um, and it is uh, you know, producing hundreds of thousands of liters of paint uh, very regularly. And then we have the superior industry. Now the superior industry um, with regards to paint is the most, uh, has the most unique expectations in the fact that it is uh, a, an asset that is put into the most harshest environments, um, but it requires the highest of aesthetics. Um, so we have a lot of uh, our chemists uh, have to have a lot of understanding of how to compose a product that's going to fit the criteria of this industry. That's probably why you don't see many uh, manufacturers in this industry, because it is so difficult to create a product of, uh, of that nature. Um, let me just turn that down. OK, so that's uh, so that's what is paint effectively so paint composition here we have a tin of paint we have four we break it down to four components these are some people um break it down into five components but for, for our understanding we just break it down to four components and we we have uh binders pigments additives and solvents and uh within anti-fouling um, just to be clear the the key elements uh that are important to anti-fouling are the binders and some would regard the uh, the biocides, which we'll talk about um, a little bit later, as being either a pigment or an additive. But this is the basics of uh, of making a paint. If you can get this right, then you know you can be the next Jotun effectively. <laughs> so we have binders. Binders are those wonderful words that we saw. These are, um, you know, the acrylics. Acrylic is the most uh, common uh, uh, commonly used uh, binder technology in anti-foulings but in in the industry in general we come across alkyds we come across vinyls epoxies epoxies are most recognized as being the uh the preferred binders uh, for um uh, for primers and then we have polyurethane acrylics polyurethane polyesters the two uh the two products that are used for top coats and then some in some instances we've got it in light gray there but polysiloxane polysiloxane is really used and utilized in the uh, other marine industries and in the protective industries of oil and gas on offshore structures. But with the emergence of uh, explorer vessels, we're seeing an uptake on these polysiloxanes being used in those scenarios as well. So the binders go in, we choose the right binder. It's really important, like I say, this is, this is where the, uh, 
uh, that can separate a, a really good manufacturer to a, you know an average manufacturer. If you get that biotechnology, if you invest in getting that biotechnology right, then you then you, you know you've got a good basis to build the product. Then we have pigments. Now we know pigments as being oh, we know pigments as being the uh, the component that really gives us color, but we also have pigments that can be um, kind of uh, functional in this purest sense. So it can, it can add color, but also we have pigments that can also have uh, a corrosion inhibiting effect. It can also help with a barrier effect. If you imagine, you may have heard of glass flakes being used in paint. So that would be classed as a uh, as a pigment or, or an aluminium flake being used as a pigment. And that can help stop the ingress of water. Um, and abrasion resistancy, gloss control. So pigments have a, an equally important role in uh, both the color, but also other elements of the products as well. So that goes in. Then we have additives. Now, additives are normally added in small amounts, uh, but they can have a significant effect on, on the paint itself. Everything from pigment stability. So if you can imagine the dispersion of pigment, rather than having pigments collected in one small area of a, of a dry film of paint, um, you need it to disperse um, uh, you know, e equally across the coat of the paint. So you know, pigment stability, improving the flow of the paint. You know, if you've come across um, certain paints that maybe don't don't stretch and flow and don't give you that real nice uh, um, definition that you like um, so it can it can have a number of effects uh, color strength heat resistancy uh, there's a lot of things that additives can be used to bring an, an additional benefit to uh, to a coating so as we put that in if you can imagine most of these elements that have gone in are are relatively dry if not dry so we need a solvent. We need a solvent that can effectively, as we see in the name, dissolve the product, dissolve the product, allowing it to move from from the tin to the, the surface that we are painting. But we want that solvent to leave. Um, and solvents can be everything from, you know, uh, different chemicals. Uh, it could be water and um, water based uh, products are, are available as well. So um, the solvent is there, like I say, to use it to get it onto the substrate and then leave the product uh, in its hard form or solid form. So the solvents go in. So now we've got the bare basics of what, um, what the, the fundamental, the foundation of paint is. So what is anti-fouling? Well, anti-fouling, as it says on the screen, is a specialized category of paint. Uh, it's applied to the outer layer of the hull um, or a ship to slow the growth or facilitate detachment of subaquatic organisms, uh, which can adversely uh, affect the uh, vessel's performance and durability. Basically, not using anti-foulings would increase uh, surface, uh, surface friction uh, and weight to the vessel. And in turn, this will increase fuel consumption, um, slows the speed, thus needing more fuel uh, to get to cruising speed, as well as deterioration of the structure itself. Um, you know, it can have a, a, a real detrimental effect on, on the actual um, substrate itself as well. But as it says here, it's, it's the final coat on a, on a system. So you have a primer. We, took, we spoke about um, epoxy. We'd have an epoxy primer and we build up the system to the point of applying an anti-fouling. Anti-fouling offers no corrosion resistancy. Um, it's there to do one function, and that is to uh, uh, stop growth. Uh, touching on the history of anti-fouling. Okay, so we have some images on the screen at the moment. Um, the photo on the left is a fantastic illustration of how challenging uh, fouling was. To careen, or uh, some people would call it keel hail, uh, a ship like this required a huge amount of manpower and effectively horsepower. Horses were drawn in to tip, tip the boat uh, to, uh, to allow the cleaning of the hull. So they would clean down the area get rid of all the growth that's existed uh, that's grown on the uh, on the on the surface uh, they would let, wait for it to dry and they would then apply a fresh layer of pitch or tar um, and then they would have to uh, uh, effectively kill how on starboard as well and do the same process very intensive very long process and uh, labor intensive and very long process um, and uh, it would probably only last the, in terms of protection around three months. So you can imagine the 
uh, the irritation that you would have having to bring out a yacht every three months to have it uh, anti -fouled. Um The image on the right hand side is a slightly different method in the fact that it is still careening over, but they're applying um, copper sheathing. Now, copper sheathing was, uh, and you know, and copper in its, its basic sense is still a a, a fantastic anti fouling. Um, but this would only really be done, as you can see from the images. The image on the left is from Malta. It's actually an image of a, a, a boat in Malta, drawn, obviously. But the image on the right-hand side, this would have been an image from a, a very um, a very expensive vessel or a vessel that has a lot of financing behind it. It's not often you would see this kind of copper sheathing being done on a, you know, a, uh, a vessel that is, you know, not of huge importance or a high high level. Um, to put it in, 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 in a sense today, you know, if, if uh, we were still using these methods, I can pretty much guarantee would be uh, copper sheathing most super yards because, you know, we want the best solution for, for, the, uh, for the vessel. The image in the, in the middle is of a book um, and it's uh, written by Rebecca Stott. And it's about the fascination that Darwin had with the barnacle. So Darwin went on his voyages and found that one of the biggest issues they had with actually completing these voyages and researches, researching um, was the fact that these barnacles were causing absolute havoc on the, on the boats. So he had a fascination with barnacles and spent about eight years studying them. So this book is quite interesting. It's a very small book, but it's, uh, it's quite interesting one and quite a funny one as well. He's, uh, he gets quite irritated with barnacles during his research he was really trying to um, fathom out how the organism works. In essence, I would say Darwin was probably uh, the founding father of us understanding how best to uh, approach uh, the subaquatic organisms and, and slowing down the growth on, on ships. Okay, so we're going to touch uh, very briefly on the environmental impact. The environmental impact um, uh, across the whole of the marine industry uh, is is significant, and it is uh, something that, uh, as a as a business like Yoten, being such a big um, a market leader in the marine industry, we're very much involved in uh, trying to uh, reduce the the carbon footprint and, and the environmental impact of, of what we do, and we do this through green steps. But anyway, that's one thing aside. What we're looking at right now is an image of a container vessel, uh, and obviously this is a computer image, but just to give you an understanding, a typical container vessel um, would burn around 125 tons of fuel every single day. That's 125 tons of fuel every single day. And it would emit um, 400 around, estimated obviously, uh, 400,000 kilograms of CO2 per day. In comparison, it would release around four kilograms of copper um into the sea from its anti fouling per day so what does this tell us these are fantastic numbers lovely very nice what it actually tells us is there's a huge imbalance so far in the regulators approach to the two types of emissions um, we we have no doubt and we you know we stand by this it's extremely good that we have a focus on uh, on biocides that are used in anti foulings um, to ensure that we don't have the really nasty ones we've seen in the past and that the, the the manufacturers in other regions may be that are producing very harsh environmentally impacting uh anti-foulings are moved away um and having to rethink how they do things but when it comes to emissions um and to give you a bit of an understanding if if the effect of uh, the biocide regulations uh would be to increase the ghg emissions the environment would lose entirely to give you a few kind of uh, interesting interesting facts it would take 50,000 years okay 50,000 years to double the amount of copper in the sea if we continue the trend line we are at the moment to double uh, the uh, carbon emissions it would take us around 50 years if we continue the trend line we are at the moment and this is why it's great that we're seeing such a, an importance being put on uh, the um, the type of technologies used on on vessels um, but also on vehicles as we see uh, with tesla the emergence of tesla and things like that so um you know it's it's of really importance and it's something that um we as a, as a business uh, are investing in continuously 
So the anti-fouling effects, we've got two areas here. We're going to look at speed loss and we're going to look at power increase. Basically, if I bring some of the slides up, you'll understand. So what we see now is an image of a freshly painted um, uh, substrate with anti-fouling. And thus, we should see zero, around zero speed loss. OK, and then no, no need to increase the power to get to cruising speed. Um, with a thin light, a thin slime layer, or we see uh, a... Uh, uh, around a 3% speed loss, and that means we need to increase the power by 9% to get to cruising. And I'll just go through these. And as you can see, once we get to a point where we see on uh, here, medium, calcareous, and fouling, and heavy, um, significant power increases. Now, for the commercial marine sector, this is a huge importance because uh, even today, the the amount of uh, the, the the cost of fuel is um, a huge part of their co overall costs as, as running a, a vessel, so it's a huge importance. But I think it's also important to understand that choosing the right anti-fouling, um, even in our industry, has a massive effect uh, on both speed loss but also on power increase. And this is something that a lot of the big super yachts. I spend most of my time with sixty plus meter yachts, and uh, and this is now becoming more and more relevant to them. And they're understanding it more and more. The marine fouling process, um, we can see in the first few seconds, in the first few minutes, um, we have what, we, what is classed as the conditioning film. This is chemicals that adhere to uh, the vessel or the yacht in this case. So once the yacht is painted and dropped back into the water, it's splashed, um, within the first few seconds and minutes, you see this conditioning film uh, occurring. You can't actually, I say see it because you can't actually see it. It's microscopic. It's nothing you can actually see, but it's actually happening on the surface. Um, but within a few, uh, a few days um, and a few weeks, you start seeing a biofilm uh, developing uh, and other microorganisms will soon settle, uh, you know, in the form of a biofilm. And these are this is getting to a point of, of being able to actually see. You're actually starting to see now a slime layer um, occurring. And then you start seeing or you will start uh, um, experiencing the attachment of algae spores for uh, the harder fouling. And then we have really, you know, uh, in, in the first few uh, months and years, you'll start seeing that developing into huge macro fouling, huge adult organisms. Now, it's, uh, it's important to recognize that in our industry, um, it might not actually take that long. Um, in actual fact, if you've got the incorrect either amount of anti-fouling or even the incorrect type of anti-fouling, and you head from, you've just been painted in the Mediterranean, you head to a Caribbean season, um, I can assure you that you'll probably end up in the first few months of seeing some uh, heavy fouling occurring. Um, and I've seen it with my own two eyes. So it's important that, like I say, it's important to understand uh, the, the anti-fouling you're using. Okay, so fouling factors. Um, this can be quite interesting to just understand the difference between our industry um, versus the majority of other uh, marine industries. OK, so here we have an image and the colors on this map uh, indicate the surface temperature. Now, the surface temperature is one meter below sea level. So this is the surface temperature um, across the globe. And we see up the top in the poles, uh, a purple color that's representing around zero degrees Celsius. Um, up until the equator, which we see across the middle there in a dark orange, or if this was in full color, probably red, and that's around 30 degrees Celsius. Um, and, you know, we, we uh, as an industry, spend a lot of time in warmer waters. Um, and the fouling factors that are involved that can impact on the amount of fouling you may see is these five factors, okay? It's typical that we will see an increase in uh, in fouling in an increase of temperature of water. But other factors, other, some of these other factors can actually play a part. Um, let's go down here. Uh, can actually play a part because. OK, we're back again. Um, because what we actually uh, find is that if you go into the uh, uh, the coastal west coast of Norway um, in a significant hectic uh, summer months, um, even though the temperature is around 10 to 15 degrees, because of the nutrients that are available to organisms there, there is actually an, an increase of uh, of, uh, of activity. 
But generally speaking, distance from shore, water depth, seawater temperature, nutrition and sunlight, they all go hand in hand predominantly. The more sunlight is generally because you're closer to the shoreline. Um, that means there's an increase in temperature of the water and there's an increase in nutrition. So these all kind of related, but it, uh, it, it will come to, uh, you come to understand it in the next couple of slides. Here we have an image of the Titanic. OK, so the Titanic has been there for a, a, a hundred years, but because it's been in such deep waters, cold waters, no lights, no nutrition, there is next to no, uh, no fouling occurring on that, on that, uh, on the, on the substrates of the Titanic. Um, uh, like I say, the differences between the industries, um, marine industry, we have 75% uh, sailing versus the super yacht, which is around one to 15%. Some obviously do more. Um, some of these, uh, some of the bigger yachts uh, and existing and explorer yachts, they may do a lot more. Um, generally speaking, we see in the marine industry uh, outside of the yachting doing around 16 knots. Again, we see differences in that as well. Um, so there's lots of different things we need to think about uh, when, when approaching the industry with solutions is what we're trying to say in this slide. So this is the fouling intensity. This is what we were speaking about in two slides ago. Um, most fouling happens in shallow waters. What we see on this graph here is effectively, this is the seawater um, and the distance from the shore in nautical miles. And then we have uh, a depth on the left-hand side as well. So if I just click away, what we see is down in this area of 0 0.1, that's, it, that's the, the intensity. That's the intensity of fouling you can, uh, can, can could occur in that area. As we start getting closer to shore and a little bit more shallow waters, you see a 1% increase. Now we're at three and a half uh, nautical miles out um, plus, and then around you know 66 meters down, uh, we're seeing a 10% increase. And then we see 25, and congratulations. <laughs> this is where we generally sit um, as an industry for longer periods. Uh, and we see a 50% uh, increase in, uh, in fouling versus where we are in the, in, the, in the deeper, darker waters. So quite intense. Um, and again, we have to make sure that we've got solutions that fit the industry. Um, we hear some, you know, some people talking about using, you know, products that are in the commercial arena. I would always advise against it because it's not designed with this scenario in mind. It's designed for the six plus nautical miles out, colder, deeper waters. Um, so don't expect it to do the same uh, principal job. We're going to touch on anti-fouling biocides, biocide history. Um, before I go on to that, um, Joanna, could you put on the uh, the poll three, the third poll, third question? Of course. Okay. And the poll is on. Excellent. So um, let's go into biocide history. Okay, so welcome to the, uh, the dark side of, uh, of the industry as it was previously. Um, I think most people have heard about uh, some of these uh, biocides that we used and they were very effective, but for very good reasons and, and very poor reasons in terms of the environment. So um, throughout history, all of, the, all of the worst toxins available have been used. Um, the first anti-fouling uh, patent was filed in the 17th century by the Royal Navy, and it contained both mercury and lead. Um, so, like I say, these have been in existence for, for a long time. But as you can see on the uh, slide at the moment, uh, mercury was uh, up until 1970 used. Now, now it's been banned. Arsenic, the same. DDT, I'm not even going to try and explain, uh, try and say that word. Um, I know it's only a Wednesday, but still, it's going to be too difficult for me to say. Uh, sounds like a dinosaur. Uh, but that was until 1970. Um, and then into, up until 2003, we saw the use of TBT. Now, I must say, I know for a fact, uh, having spoken to a lot of captains and a lot of crew members um, in the past few years, that TBT is still available in certain regions. We don't produce it as a business, but there is, um, there is uh, certain manufacturers uh, that are still offering TBT um, uh, products in certain regions. Um, but, uh, you know, from 1990 onwards, we're seeing a lot of uh, organic biocides used, and that's what we use. So one thing to understand, this is where I sometimes uh, 
uh, this is this is an important thing to if you've got a notepad next to you. This is one of the things I would note down. Okay, so you have things we just spoke about biocides. Okay, a biocide is a copper compound, and it says on here or referred to as a biocide. It, pre it prevents the animal fouling. It prevents what we see on the picture. It prevents the macro fouling. Okay, um, but there is also another biocide effectively that's put into products or should be put into products in my opinion um, and that is what we also use which is cobiocides and cobiocides are there to prevent the algae the green the plant fouling okay it is extremely important to have a product that has both but i can assure you and i know many there's some uh, big manufacturers or i'm not going to name any but big manufacturers that still supply products that only have one of these com these biocides in one of these components in so if you're looking for an all-round solution, it's important to know the uh, uh, whether or not the product has both biocides and co-biocides, because um, you could end up with a green hull, uh, might not have any uh, um, uh, hard fouling occurring, or you could have the opposite, you could have hard fouling, um, and but it's keeping, it's only got co-biocides in, which is keeping the green away. So it's important to know that as well. Um, just made a note, I've got a note here as well. There is 4,000 different species uh, that have been identified uh, on vessels of holes. And this, you know, biocide package, as we call it in the industry, has to uh, protect against all of them. So, you know, you can imagine the, the chemists are hard at work ensuring that we have uh, something that's both organic, but also uh, that fits the bill. Uh, cuprous oxide is... The, the kind of uh, the go-to biocide uh, nowadays. Um, it, it's it, it's character, characteristically dark in color, dark red in color. Um, and it's found in, like I say, in many uh, anti-foulings. Um, in, in, in actual fact, in the, in the old days, uh, uh, there, and there is still a kind of a, 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 a mindset of, in, in, in previous times, there was a, a, a thing in, in the mind that said, OK, well, if I've got red anti-fouling, it's a good anti-fouling. If you saw a really bright red anti-fouling, you saw that as being a must be a really good anti-fouling. Obviously, nowadays, that's not necessarily uh, not necessarily true. Um, like I say, this is cuprous oxide. It's a it's a it's a, um, a effectively a, a, I would call it a byproduct of copper. Um, it's a broad spectrum biocide. Uh, the ions are toxic. This is a pretty important one as well. But when it actually gets released from the coating, it is very quickly, um, almost immediately, turns into a non-toxic compound. Okay, and it's a color pigment as well. Um, and as it says on there, copper is a natural ingredient in seawater. It's, it's it's always always been there. So it's 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 uh, it's nothing nothing new to the oceans. Um, and we even see it in the uh, in the agricultural industry uh, used as a, a, a pesticide, effectively. Um, and the EU legislation for organic producers permits, on average, uh, six kilograms per hectare per year. So I mean, it's it's regularly used in other industries as well. Copper anti-fouling history, um, as I mentioned earlier, copper sheathing was used. This is an image of the Cutty Sark in the uh, in the UK, uh, in Greenwich, in, in London, where I'm from. Um, and you can actually go and see this copper sheathing. Um, uh, it's in a museum now, it's a, or it is a museum, should I say? And you can go and see this copper sheathing. Um, the the challenge was was this was a fantastic anti fouling, but as I, as I mentioned about the industrial revolution, as we saw the emergence of steel hulls, um, copper is uh, an element that doesn't work. Uh, you know, generally speaking, this type of copper you see on the screen would uh, is more noble, as we would say in the industry, than than steel. So what happens is is that the steel would cor corrode um, and sacrifice itself um, before the uh, the copper. So we had to change how we deliver copper effectively onto a steel hull. Um, but you know, now we see, like I say, we're seeing a type of copper that doesn't necessarily have an impact uh, on the substrate itself so i mean there's you know a lot of people talk about aluminium holes and whether or not you can use a copper based product in some instances not every instance but you need to, you need to check but in some instances it's possible um, depending on what the type of copper they've used as a as a as a biocide i mean as early as 1625 copper has been used oh, 
uh, has been used uh, as an antifoulant, uh, and it's got more and more, cop uh, more and more common in the 18th century. Okay, so biocide release. Uh, we're going to see how the biocide uh, works in, in, in essence. It, this is a, um, what you'll see on the, on the screen right now. Gary, yes, hi. Go. Sorry to interrupt. Did you see Adam's question here on the side asking how long can a biocide last? No, I didn't see it. No, no, no. Uh, it, in, in, it, it depends on which sense. I mean, uh, the, the biocide is inactive um, in the coating. OK, so when it actually you'll see this now, it's the um, the, the red dots, as we see in this picture now, is um, representing cuprous oxide. This is the biocide to prevent the animal fouling, the, the uh, macro fouling. Um, the white element is the co-biocide to uh, help with the uh, uh, the green plant fouling. And then we have insoluble pigment, which is the color effectively. Yeah. So what, what you'll see in this image may answer that question. Um, so as it sits at the moment, this is a painted uh, steel structure uh, or hull, um, and the seawater in blue um, will start uh, an effect. Okay, the cobiocides and cuprous oxide, so the biocide and cobiocide, will leave the product. Okay, slowly, and it should be uh, you know in cer certain products that you'll come across in the, in the slides as well. In certain products, it's very predictable. In some others, it's less, much less predictable. Um, but they will leave the product. Once they leave the product, it's almost like a, a distasteful, it becomes a distasteful environment for the, uh, the, the fouling to come and attach to it. Because that's all that um, subaquatic organisms are looking for, especially uh, barnacles and things like that. They're looking for a, a place to go and, and attach themselves to them, you know, effectively live out their life. Um, and the idea of this situation is to make it a distasteful environment for them to come uh, and, and, and be, uh, place themselves on that substrate. So once it leaves, um, then it becomes inactive. OK, so it becomes an inactive element. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers the question, but it. So how long does a biocide uh, last? It lasts as, as long as the coating lasts. So you have biocides in your coating. It, once it releases and gets released from the coating, um, then uh, then you'll see uh, it becomes inactive. Okay, Adam, if if you have further questions on that, um, feel free to add them in the chat, and we can yeah. look at them at the end. Um, Stephen Thomas is with us as well. Um, he mentioned earlier that the sea in Jeddah, where he is currently, is sometimes thirty centigrade and above. Yeah. Um, but he's just mentioned, he's asking now your thoughts on ultrasonic anti-fouling. Would you like to come to that at the end? Or? Yeah, I'll come, to, I'll come to that at the end because we're going to be covering off kind of like the futures of technologies, uh, future technologies of anti-fouling. So, and that plays okay. a little bit of a part in that, in, in the respects that it's a, it's a technology that's trying to be utilised now. But yeah, I've okay. got some experience in it, so I'll, I'll answer at the end. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so the, I mean... Uh, to, to best explain this uh, diagram, that there is two uh, biocide release technologies that exist in the industry. OK, there's one that's called iron exchange. This is the majority of products out there. Um, other than one product, it's probably 95 percent of what you're seeing out in the market. Um, and that works on a very different basis of acetoacrylate, um, which is a different technology. And like I say, we'll, we'll come on to that in a moment. Um, but you'll see the difference in in polishing rate. So what happens here is you've got you've got uh, on the screen now an insoluble uh, pigment layer. And what we're looking now for is um, effectively abrasion from movement to then polish the product. So my, in my terminologies, I know this is not an industry standard, but in my terminologies, if you've got this situation, and this is you know iron exchange products, if you've got this situation, then it's not what I would call a true uh, self-polishing product. It's called self-polishing, but it's not a true self-polishing. It's not actually polishing itself. It needs that element of, uh, you know, movement to actually polish the surface. So that, that that's just like I say, just my opinion. Uh, binary technology. Okay, so self-polishing mechanism. So we hear about self-polishing and we hear about hard matrix anti-foulings. Um, here's a, a, a very quick clip. I'm, I'm hoping this is going to work. It looks good. Okay, so what we're seeing now is seawater up here. Um, and we have primer layer, and this is the anti fouling. Okay, so there's a primer layer, as it says here, anti fouling layers. So as the water is moving, 
the biocide has been has been released from the coating, and this is the polishing happening now. So the biocide and cobiocide is left. Insoluble pigment is now being released from the coating thanks to the presence of, uh, uh, of movement on water. And that's self-explanatory. Uh, Self-polishing anti-foulings. Um, now, where, where should we begin with this slide? Uh, this is a leach layer, okay? To put this, to put this uh, uh, slide into best context, um, or into perspective, a human hair is around 75 microns, okay? This uh, coating thickness you see under the microscope is about two human hairs thick. So it's about 150 microns of, of paint, of coating, yeah? On the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see water barrier coat. This is basically a, 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 a coating that was put on top of the anti-fouling to stop it actually uh, eroding and, and, and polishing. Um, and then we put it through its testing period. Um, Anti-foulings differ from all other paints in one aspect. It's the one paint that is designed to disappear. Okay, uh, and this cross section illustrates the dry film thickness before and after exposure to the seawater. Uh, the the um, uh, there is a thin leach layer, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, measuring about uh, ten microns uh, thick. Okay. This leach layer is basically a dead skin. It's where the, the red pigmentation you see in the product, that is uh, the biocide. So the biocide has left the product and you're left with this leach layer. This is uh, a dead, like I say, a dead skin. It's not, it's not doing anything. It might still be color. It might still be blue in color, but it's actually not doing anything. Um, but it can be a very, it's important to have the right polishing mechanism because this, if it doesn't polish correctly, can be a fantastic breeding ground again for growth. And this is when we see, you know, the first six, maybe 12 months performing well, but the leach layer has grown. Um, it's not been removed uh, through self-polishing, it's self-polishing mechanism, and then it becomes a perfect keying area for growth. So as I mentioned, there's two types of technologies out there, um, silyl acrylate and iron exchange. Um, and you'll see in these slides the, the key difference and why I truly believe that uh, of yachts that are looking for over two year protection um, and significant protection, they should be considering what they're using. So a uh, iron exchange product is um, hydrophilic. It basically needs the water. It soaks in the water, uh, the seawater, to start the mechanism of releasing biocides. Okay, so, um, probably the best best sense or the best kind of uh, explanation and and the word philic obviously comes from um, a strong attraction a strong attraction uh, or affinity for something uh, love of you know as a philanthropy, philanthropy try and say that on a wednesday um the love of human race um and a, a thalassophile uh, which is the which probably most people on here are which is the love or affinity of sea um, and then phobic, obviously meaning uh, dislike, uh, the opposite is to repel uh, arachnophobia, spiders. Um, I believe my kids are ablutophobic, which means that they're scared of water <laughs> or scared of washing in particular. And you also have xanthophobic, yeah, try to say that again, xanthophobic, which is the fear of yellow of all things, the fear of the color yellow. So um, hydrophobic, obviously, like I say, repels the water. It's repelling the water. Um, it's actually stopping the ingress of water. One needs water to come in to do to do its job. The other one is actually repelling it to do its job. This is probably best explained in this uh, next few uh, slides. So water molecules enter the, the coating, uh, saturates the coating, um, and then the blue uh, signs are effectively the biocides and co-biocides. Hydrophobic, uh, so this is, again, one is iron exchange, one is silver binder. Um, it actually retracts. So what happens here, thanks to, to the change of technology, is the biocides are released in a very predictive way. Now, if anybody on the call has ever used Imperial, which is the product on the left-hand side there, or Imperial XTR, which is the American version, um, you will understand what I mean by that. It's extremely predictable, as long as we know what your cruising pattern is and the parameters. Um, then we can decipher exactly how much coating you need and what that polishing rate is. 
The downside of iron exchange, which is the majority of the industry, um, is that the products get saturated, the biocides leave erratically, and you have no predictability, or should I say very limited predictability, okay? But we have a product there, Non Stop Supreme, which is, you know, uh, for people that are familiar with our competitors' um, products, it's, it's effectively that's our our product that competes against those products. Imperial is not the same as any other products in the in the market. Um, and then we have a hard anti foulings. Now, for those guys that are on uh, sailing yachts, um, you'll be f maybe familiar with this. This is a technology that's used. They have been used um, to to great degree. Um, and what happens with this particular product is that the um, it doesn't polish, you know, you, ha you have to polish it yourself. Um, I'm that. There we go. So yeah, so you have to polish it yourself. Um, and uh, you can see a lot of biocide and co-biocide in the product there, uh, or, or a biocide in, in this case. Um, but and it's, it's a very smooth, slick surface, hence the reason why it's used on a lot of uh, racing yachts. But there's a lot of super yachts now that are um, utilizing this product. So what they'll use is, as an example, if you've got a, a you're on a yacht that is getting a regular cleaning of the waterline, that boot top area, um, which is quite common because obviously guests are coming on on board and you want to make the boat, you know, look look its best. Um, they will clean that waterline. Now the problem with that is when you use a softer anti fouling, a self polishing anti fouling, um, you're doing the job that the seawater would do, and you're doing it quite vigorously. So you're removing anti fouling. Um, and uh, you can very quickly find that the water line is, uh, is you know, is, sh is starting to show through to, you know, primer layers and things like that. So what a lot of uh, some some of these larger yachts, uh, and I won't name name them, but there's very well known large super yachts using this. They will put this behind the, um, if you can see my hands, they'll put this behind this uh, self polishing anti fouling. And so what that does then is they will know when they've gone through the self polishing uh, anti fouling and they've hit hard anti fouling. But the great thing about that is is that you know with hard anti fouling you've probably got about 12 months protection if if you're lucky 12 months prote protection. So you know you've got a bit of time to now think about okay we've now hit the hard anti fouling we need to start looking at when we're coming out next or tell the crew not to clean so hard. <laughs> Uh, so here we go. It's just an overview of the uh, anti fouling binding technology. Because of the um, predictability of uh, siloacrylate, you can get uh, um, a 36 month uh, performance guarantee from Yoten. Um, like I said, it's hydrolyzing, self polishing, and self smoothing. Um, so, self smoothing basically means that the product actually, um, when it's underway, um, actually, actually smooths itself as well. So, that, that abrasion that's occurring uh, from the seawater. Um, actually, uh, the, the product will self smooth. Um, it's highly predictable in terms of its polishing rate, um, even at low cruising. So if you're if you're one of those yachts that sits in a, a marina, um, you know, quite a lot or often, um, then uh, this is something that you should consider. Um, the iron exchange product um, is, it, like I said, it's the same, uh, well, not the same, but it's very similar to the uh, some of the other products that are out there in the market. You can get it up to a 24 month performance guarantee. And then you have the boot top solution, as I mentioned, using racing as a, as a, in conjunction with a self polishing, uh, which can be suitable for some of the yachts that are seeing uh, heavy cleaning on, on water lines. Okay, so we're gonna to touch very briefly on um, anti fouling in the future. Um, this, as I said before, this is heavily regulated area. Um, regulations are are key um, to to development of products. It has an impact on what we are able to bring into market, and it will continue to influence um, the innovations from manufacturers um, and what we're able to bring. So um, you know, it's important that we are close to the regulators, that we understand uh, what's coming. We have an, we can have some form of a, a you know a discussion around that. And have an opportunity to present, um, our, you know, our our side of things. But it is it's all for the good, um, in my opinion. It's all for the good of uh, the next generations, because um, it is important that we are looking after our oceans and the environment in general. So uh, anything we can do to try and make that possible and even more possible is uh, is a benefit. Um, 
so in the EU, you have, just very before I go on to the Americas, um, with the EU, we have what is known as the Biocidal Products Regulation, the BPR. Now, you may have seen, uh, that coming to force in, well, it started its course in 2012, I believe. Um, but you may have seen changes of products, uh, especially in other manufacturers. You may have seen changes of uh, formulations. They may have renamed it, rebranded it. Generally, it's because of uh, maybe they've, they've not... Um, been able to meet the criteria of the regulations so they've had to adjust their formulations it's quite normal um but uh there is a huge amount of regulations and we don't have to just think about the eu regulations we have to think about the localized regulations in america so in the state of uh, i believe in georgia and uh, in florida they have their own regulations on what products can use or what can you, that can be used hence the reason why we have an imperial in the in, the, in europe and then we have an imperial xtr in america they're very similar in, in their products, but there's certain things that are elements that are in the product that maybe need to be increased or, or decreased to, to meet the regulations. Um, and, and we've got the, you know, we've got the, the, the UK, or the, you know, that's going to be a, 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 an interesting situation. My understanding is that they will adopt the similar, similar regulations as the EU moving forward. Um, and even Turkey have done the same. Most of these states have got their own uh, regulations um, on products that can be used or applied. Um, and, uh, and we, like I say, we have to uh, conform to all those. So it's, it's a balancing act uh, for, for both our chemists and our, our business in general. Um, but rest assured, like I said, um, as, a mo as a global market leader in the industries of, of, of the marine industry in general, um, we are very close to these regulators and we are always um, well informed about what's coming. So, uh, you know, products that you are using are generally going to be OK for a, a good long, a good long period. Um, foul release coatings. This is a, a, a thing that's starting to come up in, in the industry. This has been used. This is used uh, more regularly in other marine uh, marine industries. But in the super oil industry, it's becoming there's some noises, noises. Let's, let's put it that way. Um, foul release coatings are. Uh, are designed really for um, you need a, a, a huge amount of energy you need uh, um, how can I put it uh, it's not very suitable for yachting yachting is a very idle you know when I say idle it's not idle uh, it's it's, a, it's an industry that sits still quite quite a lot um, whereas you know the commercial marine sector is continuously moving as we saw on, on the slides before so this, this this product is really truly designed for that type of scenario now there is two types of foul release coatings there is foul release coatings that have no biocides um, so the idea is is that it's very slick it's you know it's very difficult so, so as soon as this uh, vessel is underway anything that's stuck to it gets released um, but I think, in my honest opinion, if we see FRCs entering the super arena, it will be in the form of a um, biocidal foul, foul release coating. So this is the same principle, but there are some additional um, uh, additional biocides put into the product to, uh, to ensure that it performs. But it could be that, um, uh, that you see this uh, in the industry um, in the next maybe five, I would say probably five to 10 years. It's quite possible quite possible and then we have biomimetic this is like a secret art uh, this is like a dark art so um, as you can imagine the, the natural world has always mother nature has always given us some fantastic uh, foundations of understanding what we can do to replicate uh, certain things um, and this biomimetic has, has, has long been studied and utilized. Um, I mean, if you can imagine, I'm trying to think now, if you imagine Da Vinci uh, with his uh, simulation of bird flight, uh, this was a, a prime example of him trying to, uh, biomimetic is trying to replicate what, what exists in nature to achieve something. Um, so, you know, as I say, as you can see from the images on, on the screen at the moment, none of these uh, uh, organisms, let's call them that, um, actually have growth occurring. But the one that really stands out for me, which it gets talked about quite often now, is the one in the middle. Now, you probably won't know what that is, but that is shark skin. Um, and sharks have a fantastic ability 
Um, and shark skin has been used for, you know, Formula One racing. They've been using a lot of uh, biomimetic technologies based around the shark skin uh, and it's uh, aerodynamics involved. Um, but it's also an extremely clever way of uh, Mother Nature being able to um, stop organisms adhering uh, to this particular animal or creature. So it's something that I think, again, it's I know there's other manufacturers and, and you know, even ourselves, we've been studying this for a good a good length of time, um, and I wouldn't be too surprised if, um, in the not so distant future, you will see technologies that replicate um, Mother Nature, like the shark skin, to help us become even more um, environmentally friendly. Okay. And then we have this picture. Uh, for those people that have not seen this, uh, you might. You've, this has been around on social media for quite a long time. This is, uh, this before anybody gets excited, this is not at the moment available in the super industry. This is a very specific uh, device that has been developed for very specific needs of some very specific <laughs> customer bases. But it is, it is an insight as to what could come. So this is um, Jotun's Hull Skater. It's a device that is um, uh, immersed and attached to the it attaches itself to the hull, and it cleans. Uh, it, it actively cleans the hull, um, and it's it works in conjunction with a spe specific coating that's developed. So you're not polishing the coating away as well. So these are for you know, like I say, very specific um, uh, requirements. Um, but I do believe that something like this could find its way into the CPU arena again not so far in the future. Um, but it's quite interesting where things are going. Okay, so that's that's the end of the presentation. If anybody's got any, I'm gonna stop sharing now. I know it's quite a long presentation, you know, we're way, way over our time. I'm surprised people haven't left for lunch. <laughs> no, it was a very interesting presentation. Thank you, Gary. Um, so I think we've I think we've covered everything um as i mentioned before stephen had the the question on the ultrasonic anti-fouling yeah um yeah so ultrasonic is um it's been used i've got i've got a, a good friend of mine who's on a 45 meter bonetti um, captain on 45 meter bonetti and he's used this um over the past probably four to five years now uh, maybe four years on on tanks uh, in particular um i think it's a clever idea but I don't necessarily see the results. Um, you still you still need to anti foul, um, but I, I truly believe that it's one of the technologies that could 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 uh, could could be developed mm. and be more interesting. At the moment, like I say, it's uh, it, it, I've seen it in use mostly on smaller uh, smaller yachts. Uh, I and when I say smaller yachts, I don't want to be disrespectful, but anything below kind of 40, 35 meters. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, so I've seen them in use with mixed responses, mixed responses. You still need to anti foul So it's kind of, yeah, it's difficult. Okay. But I think it is quite interesting. It is quite interesting, that's for sure. It's, it's something I've, I've been keeping an eye on just to see how it develops. Well, if, um, if Stephen wishes to discuss this more with you, um, yeah. We'll be putting you in direct contact with him to be able to do so. Um, great. So 38 meters, Stephen says. That's fine. Yeah. So like I say, I've seen, I've seen them in use in that type of size, um, but um, it's a mixed response. It's a mixed response, and for sure, it's, okay. uh, it's, it's interesting. And he mentions here that uh, he says we find that we extend the life of our anti-fouling by 50 to 75 percent. Right. Okay. 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 Like I say, I'm 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 all ears. I'm not just representing, <laughs> to be honest. I'm not just representing Jotun. I am all ears because I, I like to see and hear things that are developing. You know, it, it encourages everybody to be more yeah. environmentally friendly and try and find new solutions. Well, well, thank you, Gary. I think that brings us to the end of our um, presentation today. So thank you for this really well presented webinar. Much appreciated. Yeah, I've just, seen, Joanna. <laughs> I've just seen a message from Stephen. Um, about the Jotun Care, uh, yeah. So, uh, apologies for that. You've not you've not heard of Jotun Care. It's been in the background. Um, like I say, it's not had official market launch, 
um, and it's been based around me trying to visit yachts where I can, uh, with who I can. Um, but, uh, but rest assured, in the next, uh, by, by autumn this year, you'll hear much more about it. It's having an official market launch and a lot of money sent to it. So <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm hoping you're going to hear a lot more about it. Okay, um, can everybody hear me? So I can, sorry? Sorry, yeah, no, yeah, everything froze for me slightly. I don't know if that was you or me. But anyway, I think this brings us to the end. Joanna, is there anything you'd like to add at the end of this webinar? Um, I will share a poll just to know what did. Uh, yeah, okay. it's okay. Uh, feedback, no, no, no problem at all. So. That'd be good to get the feedback. Oh, and ah, I yes. think there's also yeah, a so handout there's a, that Gary yeah. would like to share. Yeah, oh, I'm just put it on a, a file right on there. It's just simply a, a brochure. Um, my contact details are on the presentation, so feel free to, to contact me uh, on email or telephone. Um, and uh, yeah, no problem at all. Great. So everyone will find that handout in the chat um, bar to the side of the screen. And if you have any further questions, um, please don't hesitate to get in touch and we can put you directly in contact with Gary. Um, who'd be really pleased to talk to you. And Gary, thank you again for today. That was really enjoyable. I and, um, oh, here we are in, in big screen. <laughs> um, so yeah, wishing everyone a good day and that everyone keeps cool. And we'll see everybody hopefully for another Lunch and Learn webinar soon. So thank you. Thank you very much, guys. All thank right you. then. Bye-bye.